<laughs> Welcome to the final installment of the 2021 Spring Anthropology, Anthropology uh, Colloquium Series at the University of New Mexico. Uh, I'm really excited for, or, for today's speaker, but before I introduce her, let me acknowledge that the University of New Mexico is located on the tr traditional land of the Pueblo of Sandia. Uh, this land holds deep historical, spiritual, and personal significance for New Mexico's indigenous peoples. We acknowledge their connection to this land and are grateful for the opportunity to live and work and learn here. So as I said, I'm very excited for today's speaker, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Zudi Sagai. Uh, and uh, Dr. Sagai uh, is a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. She received her bachelor's degree in natural sciences and biological anthropology in 2009 from the University of Cambridge. Uh, and then she received a master's degree in 2012 uh, from the University College London and her PhD in, in 2018, uh, uh, is that right? <laughs> 2018 uh, from the Max Planck Institute. And, and she's been uh, there doing a, a postdoctoral research position since then. Um, her research interests include bone functional adaptation, uh, functional morphology of the, the skeleton, biomechanics of locomotion, origins of bipedalism, and many other issues uh, that are important in the field of paleoanthropology. Uh, she's published an awful lot of really great articles for being so early in her career, including papers in some of the journals of highest impact out there. So uh, today she is going to be presenting a talk entitled Reconstructing Be Behavior in the Past, Identifying Behavioral Signals from the Internal Structure of the Skeleton in Humans and Apes. Thank you very much for joining us today. Great, thank you very much for the introduction, Ian. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about some of my research into reconstructing behavior in the past, looking at the internal structure of the skeleton in humans and apes. Uh, so the locomotor behavior of our early ancestors, the Australopithecines, has been reconstructed in very different ways. Like living apes today, we know that in the past, our ancestors depended on an arboreal ecological niche. However, the precise time in our evolutionary history when our dependency on an arboreal environment was reduced remains unknown. And locomotion is very important. It has consequences for several aspects of a species ecological niche, as you can see in these two divergent reconstructions of one of our ancestors. Um, locomotion impacts diet, it impacts predator avoidance strategies, and even um, down to details such as where you sleep at night. Uh, different interpretations occur because fossils are frequently found to have a mosaic of primitive and derived traits. An example which has been debated for decades is the morphology of Australopithecus afarensis shown here. This is a partial skeleton, which is quite famous, known as Lucy, that was found in Ethiopia in 1974. The morphology of this species has proved difficult to interpret because it has features of the lower limb, which indicate it was a biped, like, like you and me. Um, these features are the shape of the pelvis, the angle of the elements of the lower limb, and some aspects of the ankle. Um, it's also evidenced by these footprints from Laitoli in Tanzania, which was thought to be made by this species. However, other features of this species morphology, such as a shoulder joint, which points upwards, long curved fingers, um, are indicative of retained arboreal behavior. And these arboreal traits have been interpreted either as um, primitive features inherited from an arboreal ancestor or indicators that this species was actually climbing trees. So we still don't know how much time our early ancestors were spending in trees. We don't know whether they relied on trees for food such as fruits, whether they slept in nests in the trees like living apes do today, and whether they used the canopy as a refuge from terrestrial predators. Um, and actually what I've talked about is sort of one or the other bipedal or partially arboreal. But actually with new fossil finds, we're moving away from an idea of a linear progression towards increasing bipedality. 
With the discovery of several new species, such as this one shown here, Australopithecus sediba, as well as the hobbit from the island of Flores um, and Homo naledi from South Africa, we see that the mosaic morphologies vary between species and change over time. So one interesting difference between these two species is the foot. Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy species, is dated between about three and four million years old, whereas this species is only two million years old. However, this more recent species has features of the foot that indicate that it was likely more arboreal than the older species. Um, so what this tells us is that over time, our ancestors have likely adapted to different ecological niches and that this transition from an arboreal species to a biped wasn't a, a linear one, but rather there was variation over time. Um, it's also important to remember that the external morphology of the skeleton isn't the whole picture. For example, soft tissue influences the range of motion in our joints and can potentially allow or limit movement. For example, the hunter-gatherers shown in these images climb trees and they flex their ankles a lot when they're climbing trees. Um, and there are no, there's no evidence of any external skeletal adaptation. So from the outside of their skeleton, you wouldn't be able to tell that they were climbing trees. Um, what my research does is looks inside the skeleton. And in this way, we might be able to find features that signify different behavioral adaptations. Um, so my research uses high resolution micro CT scans, and this allows us to look at the internal bone structure. Here you can see a micro CT scan of a chimpanzee distal tibia. This is the bone just above the ankle. Um, and in these CT scans, we can see inside the bones. Bones have an outer layer of cortex and an inner mesh of trabecular structure. Um, and the, these two types of bone, the thickness of the cortex and the structure of the trabecular bone change during life in response to behavior, with bone being deposited in regions that experience more strain and being removed where strain is reduced. So um, there you can see a CT image. And so in this way, the internal bone structure reveals what an individual actually did during its lifetime. Um, there are several natural experiments that demonstrate this ability of bone to adapt during life in response to behavior. For example, tennis players have stronger cortical bone in their dominant arm. Racing greyhounds always run the same way around the track and they have stronger cortical bone in their right paw. There are also experimental studies that show this plasticity of internal bone structure. Here on the left, you can see an experimental study in guinea fowl. Now these guinea fowl are exercised at an incline, so here's the, the incline group, for not very long at all, about 10 minutes a day for 45 days. And following this, there's a change in the orientation of the bone that corresponds with this change in joint angle. Um, and a similar study on the right in sheep finds a similar result. Um, that these sheep are exercised in an incline or they wear high heels. And there's this a, the, a similar change in joint position, which corresponds to the change in bone structure. So really over a very short period of time, bone can, can adapt. Um, so the research that I'm gonna to present today, I'm gonna to show how we can better understand the relationship between internal bone structure and behavior using three approaches. The first approach is a regional approach, looking at specific regions of the skeleton to identify in humans and apes, to identify signals of behavior. The second is a systemic approach, by which I mean looking across the entire skeleton, and this can help us to identify behavioral signals. And the third approach I will talk about today is looking at ontogenetic changes, so changes during growth and development in chimpanzees. Um, so the, a quick overview of the methodological, methodological approaches that I use. Um, so how do we measure this internal bone structure? One method is a VOI method or a volume of interest. And this involves extracting a cube of bone digitally, virtually, and measuring the bone structure in that region. So the two measures of bone structure that I will talk about today are bone volume fraction, 
which is a measure of how much bone there is in that cube. So say that cube was half bone and half not bone, the bone volume fraction would be 0 0.5. The second measure is degree of anisotropy. This is a measure of how uniformly oriented the bone is. So a high degree of anisotropy would be like this, with all of the struts pointing in one direction. And a low degree of anisotropy would be the struts pointing in all different directions. What this signifies is how uniform the loading regime is. So if a joint is always loaded from the same direction, we would expect the bone to, to be uniformly oriented. However, if the joint is loaded from lots of different directions, then we would expect a structure like this. The second methodological approach that I will um, talk about today is what we call the whole epiphysis or whole bone method. This allows us to create a color map of this bone volume fraction across an entire region. So what this shows us is regions in red are places where there's a lot of bone and regions in blue are places where there, there is much less bone. So these are the two methods. Um, so when we first applied this method, we started looking at, at hand bones and we didn't really know what, what to expect, but we knew that by looking at the, the images that we see in the CT scans, there seemed to be differences between species. So um, in this study, we looked at the trabecular bone at the base of the middle finger. So this is the finger and this is the, the met third metacarpal head so at the base of the middle finger. And um, apes load this joint very differently during locomotion. Orangutans that climb trees have a, um, so it's, it's this here. Orangutans that climb trees use flexed joint positions as shown here. Whereas African apes, gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos, they um, knuckle walk. And this involves putting the, the middle segment of their finger on the ground. And this joint is, is what we call dorsiflexed. Um, what we find is that the distribution of bone corresponds to this joint position. In orangutans, there is most bone here, which corresponds to where the finger sits on that joint. And in chimpanzees, there is most bone here, which corresponds to where the finger sits on that joint. So when we look at this distribution, we find that it corresponds with um, the predicted loading and their respective locomotor modes. So I will now show examples from a couple of other regions of the skeleton where we found the, set, the same pattern, that, that this distribution really does reflect behavior. Um, the first bones that I will show you images from are from the ankle. So this is the, the tibia, this is the ankle joint, and this is the talus, which is the, the bone in your foot just beneath the ankle. Um, this involves two joints. This is the, the ankle joint, as I said, and this is the talonavicular joint, but today I will say that this is the joint between the talus and the rest of the foot. So that's what I mean when I, when I say that. Um, and this study looks at humans and chimpanzees, um, which differ in the, the loading of this joint during locomotion. So during bipedalism, humans have an, a sort of approximately 90 degree angle um, between the tibia and the foot. In chimpanzees, during knuckle walking, this angle is much smaller, it's more flexed. And the same during climbing in chimpanzees, this angle is much smaller. This is what we call dorsiflexion, so that the foot is flexed upwards. Um, the other difference in locomotion, um, loading of the foot during locomotion in these species is mobility. In climbing chimpanzees and, and other apes, they use a lot of different foot postures while they climb. Um, in contrast, the human foot is very stable. It acts as a, a rigid lever during bipedal locomotion. So there is a lot more mobility in the foot of chimpanzees compared to humans. So now um, I will show you the, these color maps showing, showing where, where there is most bone in these, most bone in the regional distribution. So in humans, this is an image of the tibia. As I said, that's the, the bone above the ankle. And this is a section, so it's sort of cut down the, down the center of the bone. This is the front and this is the back. 
In humans, the bone is mostly concentrated in the middle of the joint, reflecting this more neutral posture of the ankle. In contrast, in chimpanzees, the bone is much more anteriorly located at the front of the tibia, corresponding to where this bone is in contact, um, where these two bones contact each other. When we look at the, these images from a slightly different view, this is looking up at the tibia, so up from the ankle, um, and this is the, the front and this is the back. In humans, the bone is quite centrally concentrated, whereas in chimpanzees, again, so this is the signal here, there is a concentration of bone at the front, again, corresponding to this, this flexion of this, of this joint. So again, in the distal tibia, we find that the bone distribution reflects the behavior of these two species. Now, looking at the, um, the joint between the talus and the rest of the foot, um, as I said before, the, in the human um, locomotion, this joint is much more rigid, whereas in chimpanzees, there is much more mobility. So in humans, we see this small localized concentration of bone reflecting this rigid position. In contrast, in chimpanzees, the bone spreads across the head of the talus, across this region, reflecting the mobility between this joint and, and the rest of the foot. Um, again, looking at this bone from a, a slightly different view, this is as if we cut the top off of the, of the talus. Um, so this would be the front, so the joint between this bone and the rest of the foot. Here in humans, there is a, a small localized concentration of bone that continues into, into the talus, into the bone, in a trajectory. In chimpanzees, this distribution is broadly spread um, and there is no trajectory into the bone. Again, this is reflecting these, these differences in locomotion between these species. Um, so what about in a different region? Do we find the same relationship between distribution and loading. Um, so I will show some results from the, the foot. This is the third metatarsal head, which is at the base of the middle toe. Um, so this is the metatarsal and this is the, the, the middle toe. Um, so in humans, this joint is quite flexed with the toe sitting high up on that, this joint. In apes, when they climb, they, they grasp their foot, you know, similar to how they use their hands, and the, the toe sits on the underside of, of this joint. And in African apes, when they knuckle walk, there is a, a joint position which is also um, flexed upwards, like humans, but the angle is much, much smaller. But so, so African apes, chimpanzees and gorillas, Use a, use a similar position to, to humans, but not to the same degree. Um, so looking at the results that of, this, of this study, we see that um, in humans, so this is the human, and um, the, this is looking as if you're the toe looking at the foot and the concentration of bone is on the upper surface. So at this point here reflecting this joint position. In orangutans, the concentration is on the underside of that bone, so reflecting this joint position. And in chimpanzees and gorillas, there's an intermediate pattern reflecting knuckle walking with a concentration on the upper side and their climbing behavior with a concentration on the underside. Um, so is there any experimental evidence that explains these patterns that we find where we see more bone in regions that experience more loading? There's um, one study which shows some experimental evidence that bone can adapt in response to behavior in a very regional localized manner. In the results shown here, some researchers loaded the tail of mice. So they put um, things in here to load this vertebra of the tail. And they measured how the bone changed over time 
in response to loading. So they scan the bone before and after this loading. And they also create a, an ex, a model, a computational model called a finite element model, which predicts, okay, if we load this vertebra in this way, where will it experience the highest forces? Um, so what they found is that regions of bone formation here, so bone was deposited here, correspond to precise regions where they predicted that there was more force or more strain on that strap. And they also find the opposite, that where there's bone resorption or bone is removed is a region where they predicted there to be very low forces on this bone. So what this data shows is that bone does seem to be able to adapt during life in response to regional loading differences. So to summarize, um, in the hand, ankle and foot, the distribution of trabecular bone inside a joint reflects joint position. Um, experimental evidence supports that these regional differences may reflect bone adapting to loading during the individual's lifetime. Um, in addition to the data that I've shown here, my collaborators have looked at other regions of the skeleton and also found a relationship between bone distribution and behavior or joint position. So this um, line of research is promising and has already been applied to fossil hominins to reconstruct their behavior. Um, so now moving on to the next section of my talk, looking at systemic patterns of trabecular structure in humans and chimpanzees. So as I said earlier, um, when I say systemic, I mean looking at different regions of the skeleton. So in this study, we looked at associated skeletons of seven chimpanzees and seven humans. Um, and we looked at the proximal humerus, the third metacarpal head, the proximal femur, the distal tibia, the talus, and the third metatarsal head, as well as the first thoracic vertebra, which isn't shown here. Um, and this an allows for analysis of variability within the skeleton of an individual, whereas most previous studies had focused on a, a single bone or, or a single region um, of the skeleton. Um, so there are several studies of trabecular bone in primates, and often it seemed that um, studies found a similar trabecular structure in a species in different regions of its skeleton. So for example, a chimpanzee has chimpanzee-like trabecular structure wherever you look in its body. And a human has human-like trabecular structure wherever you look in the body. So it seemed as though there were potentially systemic factors affecting the structure of this bone and not behavior. For example, in the hand of living apes, we have found that bonobos, so here in this image, have a much higher bone volume fraction, so much more bone than other apes. And we can't explain this by their behavior or their activity level. There isn't a, a behavioral explanation for this. Um, so there must be something else. Um, there are several possibilities. One interesting difference between bonobos and chimpanzees is that there's a difference in the timing of the release of thyroid hormone hormone in these two species during development. So in chimpanzees, it's released earlier and it reaches higher levels than in bonobos. And these are hormones that, as well as regulating behavior, they also affect growth and metabolism. So it's possible that there are hormonal, genetic, or taxonomic differences affecting the internal structure of bone. Other factors that can affect the internal structure of bone are activity levels. Several studies have found that more active humans or hunter-gatherers have much more bone than sedentary people like, like me who sits at a desk all, all day. Um, so this is a difference within human groups in the amount of bone in their joints. Another factor that affects bone structure is the element. So for example, studies have found a reduction in bone volume fraction, so the amount of bone as you move distally in a limb. Other factors that of course can affect your internal bone structure is your ontogenetic stage. Um, chimpanzees, for example, at different ontogenetic stages have different locomotor repertoires as they, as they age. Um, so the two factors that I will focus on now is first of all looking at whether humans and chimpanzees differ in the amount of bone they have in their joints 
throughout the skeleton. And the second is whether humans who are bipeds and only load their lower limb compared to chimpanzees that are quadrupeds and also arboreal and load both limbs, whether there's a difference between the lower limb and the upper limb related to this differential loading during locomotion. Um, so this differential loading of the forelimb and hind limb is, is interesting because previous studies have looked at cortical bone in the femur and in the humerus. So this is several primate species. And what they found is that humans, here the red triangles, have a much stronger femur compared to their humerus. When you look at the cortex, that outer layer of bone, and this makes sense because they load their, we load our lower limbs much more than our upper limbs. In contrast, the same difference isn't found in the trabecular bone structure. Humans have a similar ratio of trabecular bone between the femur and the lower limb and the humerus and the upper limb as other apes and primates. Um, so the, the first um, data that I will show you from my study is looking at the individuals and how much bone they have throughout their skeleton. On the x-axis, you see the different regions on the y-axis, the amount of bone, and each of this, these lines is one individual. So this shows all the human individuals in the sample. If we then look at the chimpanzees, we see that in general, chimpanzees do have a higher BVTV throughout their skeletons. What is interesting about these results is as you see, we have one human individual in our sample that has a much higher bone volume fraction than the other humans. Um, this is particularly interesting because unfortunately there's no historical information about these on an individual level, but perhaps this person was more active or had some other factor contributing to this systemically higher amount of bone in the skeleton. Um, so looking at this difference between the forelimb and the hind limb, um, as I said, as chimpanzees load both their forelimb and hind limb during terrestrial and arboreal locomotion, but in humans the forelimb is removed from locomotion, we would expect a difference, but previous studies haven't found this. Um, again, here are the different skeletal elements and the bone volume fraction. Um, and if we look in the human humerus and femur and the chimpanzee humerus and femur, we see a similar ratio as other studies found. However, when we look across the entire skeleton, we see a very different pattern, which is that in humans, in red, we see that the humerus has a much lower bone volume fraction than the rest of the skeleton. And this makes sense because we know that we load our, our upper limb less, our humerus less. Chimpanzees, on the other hand, have a humerus which is similar to the rest of the skeleton but their femur and their talus have a much higher bone volume fraction. So what this means is that the similar ratio in humans and in chimpanzees has, is achieved through a very different systemic pattern across the body. So in this way, a systemic approach reveals that there is a difference between humans and chimpanzees, um, which wasn't shown when just looking at two regions of the skeleton. Um, in contrast, when we compare the hand and foot, so this is a bone in the hand and a bone in the foot, we don't find this pattern that they're very similar. So the hand and foot aren't showing this behavioral signal. And compared to the rest of the skeleton, we also don't see this behavioral signal. Um, here I will show the results of the degree of anisotropy, which is this um, uniformity of orientation. And if you remember a high degree of anisotropy reflects a uniform orientation and a low degree of anisotropy reflects a, a um, much more varied orientation reflecting stereotypical versus varied loading. And I will just focus on the foot here. And what we find in humans is that the trabecular structure of these two bones in the foot is much more organized than in chimpanzees. And this is reflecting this much more stereotypical loading compared to the mobility of the chimpanzee foot. Um, and I've put some images here from the CT data, you know, I show you some numbers, but here you can really see that this structure of trabecular bone is very organized and much more straight 
compared to in the, so this is the human compared to in the chimpanzee. Um, so to summarize what we can learn from looking across the skeleton is we see that chimpanzees do have in general a higher amount of bone throughout the skeleton compared to humans. Um, and by looking across the skeleton using a systemic analysis, we can identify a different pattern of bone volume fraction in the humerus and femur in the upper and lower limb in humans and chimpanzees when compared to studies that haven't included several regions of the skeleton. Um, and we also find that the trabecular structure of the human foot is much more uniformly oriented, reflecting this difference in how the foot is loaded during locomotion. So now moving on to the, the third topic I, I wanted to talk about today, and that's looking at the ontogeny or the development of trabecular bone in the chimpanzee, humerus, femur and, femur and tibia. Um, this study was made possible because um, in my department here at the Max Planck Institute are primatologists and they work here in Cote d'Ivoire on a group of chimpanzees. And when these chimpanzees die of, of natural causes, they bring their skeletons here to Leipzig. And what that means is we have a sample of individuals of known age and known sex, which is very rare when you looking in museum collections. So this is what, what made it possible to, to do this study. Um, just a quick um, note about how bones grow. So, so what, what happens during growth? Um, this is a histological image of a bone. This is the epiphysis or joint, and this is the growth plate. What happens is bone is, first of all, cartilage is deposited here, and then it gets turned to bone. And what um, we do when we study trabecular ontogeny or development of this internal bone structure is we place a, a VOI, a region of interest here, um, across different ages. And what's important to remember is that what we're measuring isn't the same. What we're measuring is the most recently deposited bone structure. So it's not really comparing the same thing across different age groups. Rather, what does the most recently deposited bone look like? Um, so what do we already know about trabecular ontogeny? Um, so this was um, the first study in apes. Um, there were several studies in humans beforehand. And what these showed, this is, these are graphs from, from previous studies looking at this bone volume fraction. And what was found was that at birth, humans have a high bone volume fraction. This reduces until they're around one or two years old and then increases again. And this is the same in two studies in the femur and also a study in the tibia, so in the lower limb. Um, this was interpreted as an indication that when children start to walk bipedally, their bone adapts in response to that behavior. So a signal of loading the leg during bipedalism. Then this study uh, in 2017 looked at the humerus. And here, this is their curve for the femur. And this here is their curve for the humerus. So they found that the humerus has this same pattern of growth that the amount of bone reduces and then increases, but not by as much as the femur. Um, so this is this is what was known about humans. And we wanted to see if, um, if, if we could find a, a similar pattern in, in chimpanzees or, or not. Um, so what happens during development in chimpanzees? So they undergo changes in their locomotive behavior as they get older. This is probably in part due to an increase in body size, reducing the amount of climbing that they're able to do. So torso orthograde suspension is a, a, a sort of more technical term for, for climbing. And this is loading of the forelimb. What we find as chimpanzees get older is this locomotion reduces and loading of the forelimb reduces. In contrast, quadrupedal walking, um, increases over time. So they start to load their hind limb more as they become adult. Um, and the other change that happens is the number of submodes, so the number of different locomotive behaviors that they engage in reduces as they get older. Um, so this is, this is how their locomotion changes and the loading of the forelimb decreases and the hind limb increases. 
Um, so in this study, we looked at adult individuals, which I will just mention briefly in these specific regions. And in the immature individuals, we measured the trabecular structure in these volumes of interest and also created these color maps um, that are similar to the ones I've already showed you. So what um, we found in the adult individuals, which I'll just mention briefly, was very interesting, which is that sex, so males and females, didn't differ significantly in the, their bone volume fraction, the amount of bone, and body size was also not a predictor of the amount of bone in either the femur, humerus, or tibia. So there seems to be no relationship amongst this, in this population of adult chimpanzees between trabecular structure, body size, and, and sex. Um, and this means that we can pull the immature individuals and study the males and females together. So here in this graph, um, each point is an individual. The, this shows the data for the tibia, so the bone above the ankle, with increasing age and the change in bone volume fraction. As you see in the tibia, there's a, it's a significant increase in bone volume fraction with increasing age. In the femur, this is the same, a significant increase. And in contrast, in the humerus, the BVT stays the same with increasing age. So this is evidence, the way we've interpreted this is that it's evidence of increased loading of the hind limb as they become less arboreal and start to rely more on, on quadrupedal locomotion, whereas the humerus doesn't change because of course, during both arboreal and quadrupedal locomotion, they're loading their upper limb. Um, what we did not find is this pattern of trabecular ontogeny, which is present in humans. Chimpanzees do not have, in these three regions, do not have this high amount of bone at birth, which reduces and then increases. So they differ to humans in the pattern of bone growth. Looking at the changes in the degree of anisotropy, again, this is this uniform orientation and a more varied orientation. Um, the tibia above the ankle shows a decrease and then an increase in this variable. The humerus shows a decrease and then a stabilization. And in the femur, it remains fairly constant across growth. Um, so these, these results are, uh, are not so easy to interpret. What is interesting is that age five is about the time at which they really start to depend much more on, on, um, on knuckle walking on this quadrupedal behavior. And that is about the time at which we see this change in the, in the tibia and also in the humerus. Um, so finally, looking at how this distribution of bone is changing over time during development. Um, this here is an image of the tibia, um, which I showed you in one of the earlier studies of an adult chimpanzee. They have this high concentration of bone at the, the front of this bone. Um, these are images of some of the individuals from our sample. And what we find is the youngest individuals have a very homogeneous distribution of bone in the tibia, femur, and humerus. And over time during development, we start to see that different regions start to develop a higher amount of bone and the distribution of bone becomes more varied across the element with increasing age, approaching um, something more similar to the adult pattern by 12 years of age. These look quite different because this is the, the of course, this bone is missing its, its joint at the, at the end. So that's why the morphology is different, but the, the bone distribution patterns develop over time. Um, so to summarize, in adult chimpanzees, trabecular bone structure is not related to either sex or body size. In immature chimpanzees, the amount of bone, the bone volume fraction increases in the femur and tibia, but not the humerus. And this can be explained by the increasing importance of quadrupedal knuckle walking behavior as they start to load the hind limb much more. And this uniformity of orientation in the humerus and the tibia decreases until about five years, subsequently increasing. 
And this does correspond to the time at which they start to knuckle walk more. And in contrast, the, the uniformity of orientation of the femur remains very similar across ontogeny. Um, so just finally to summarize this, I think what this research is able to show is that first of all, we do find that the distribution of trabecular bone reflects joint position and we can use this to reconstruct the behavior of fossil hominins in the past. Second of all, through looking at a systemic approach and an ontogenetic approach, we also see that these measures of bone, so how much bone there is, seems to vary between skeletal elements and during growth in ways that aren't easy to predict and are likely affected by factors other than behavior. But by looking at living species in this way, we can start to tease apart which factors of this bone structure can be related to behavior. And then we can look at fossils and understand more about how arboreal our ancestors were, and also about whether they um, you walked in a similar way to us, whether their mode of walking was the same as ours. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators that have contributed to this research institutions and also the funding bodies that have supported this project. Great. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you very awesome. much, Judy. That was that was fantastic. A very, very elegant talk. Um, if if people have uh, questions, I encourage you to just turn on your camera and, and ask questions. Um, Hi, um, sorry, I can't turn my camera on. It's not working right now, but do you have any like inkling of what other than like a primate's behavior would cause uh, like a change in bone, bone formation? Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think there are lots of, lots of possible things. And one of the things that I have found it very interesting what we've done is that different regions of the skeleton and also of course some of Ian's work different regions of the skeleton seem to respond differently to mechanical loading is one factor. So how responsive a part of the skeleton is seems to differ between different regions, perhaps also between different species. One factor that people commonly um, use is activity level. So it's quite a common argument that the more active an individual is, the stronger its skeleton is. So the fact that humans, like, like me, for example, I probably have a very grassland skeleton um, compared to a hunter-gatherer, but we really don't have any actual evidence that activity level is the contributing factor. So I would say that the jury is still out. There are so many things, genetics, hormones. Um, although I don't find differences between males and female chimpanzees in my sample, for example, I mean, in humans, there are differences. So. Um, I think that there still is a lot of work to be done before we can really answer answer that question. Thank you. Great. Maybe Thank you. Agree. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, I'm curious what you think about. Uh, I, I I don't. I'm curious what you think about the um, possibility that physical activity can have, uh, can lead to a systemic influence on the skeleton via hormonal changes that might take place uh, in, in response to physical activity. Yeah, um, so we definitely did find in this one human individual that we have, they're from the same population, there isn't a, a difference in age. This human individual did have this much higher um, bone volume fraction throughout the body. We wanted to try to include, I think the way to test it is you know, something to, similar to what um, Lieberman did, is to look at a region of the body that isn't loaded compared to regions that aren't, so the cranial vault. We included the thoracic vertebra as a sort of test of this, and there wasn't a, um, it didn't obviously stand out or reflect any difference. So. I think that it is possible, and I think that could be one factor that possibly contributes to it, but I think the picture is much more complex than that. And I think moving more towards understanding the genetics of these things 
can start to answer some of these questions or more experimental studies. So something, as you know, that we want to do is start to collect this data from, from living individuals where we can really ask them, okay, well, what are your activity levels? Um, and um, of course, um, in living individuals, we can't collect this sort of data because this high resolution micro CT data exposes an individual to too much radiation. But there are other methodologies like um, P PQCT and things like that, where we can get data from living individuals. Um, but I think it's very difficult to develop a study design where you have a region of the skeleton that is not loaded versus regions. But uh, you know, it, it's 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 very difficult. And I think even the cranial vault maybe isn't ideal. I know that there is some more recent work that um, that shows that there isn't this relationship between cranial vault thickness and the robusticity of the rest of the skeleton. But yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's a good answer. <laughs> there, there, yeah, I, I think I agree with you entirely that it's possible, but there's a, there's more data that we would need to see to. to exactly. make Which is interesting, right? That there yeah. are still questions that that um that, that we have to answer. Yeah. Cool. Um, anybody else have any questions? Hi, I guess I have a question. Um, first of all, I would like to say uh, great talk. And um, I guess I, I was particularly interested in the, in, in the differences that uh, you provided between chimps and bonobos. Um, I might have missed this, but um, is there currently evidence that, that chimps and bonobos have different physical activity levels? So the, at the moment, the evidence for the differences between bonobos and chimpanzees are that bonobos are maybe more arboreal than chimpanzees, that chimpanzees travel on the ground using terrestrial knuckle walking for much longer times. But I think that the, um, the data, in these studies are quite old. And I think that the bonobos that they studied at the time weren't fully habituated. So it's possible that they were spending more time in the trees just because they weren't fully habituated to the researchers. But um, so with regard to their locomotor mode, there is an idea that chimpanzees are more terrestrial, but the data isn't, isn't so strong. With regard to activity level, to my knowledge that there, there isn't any data about whether bonobos spend uh, more time engaging in more active behaviors. Of course, bonobos are slightly smaller, especially we have um, the, uh, Thai chimpanzees, which are large, larger than bonobos, so even though there is a size difference, so on average, then the bonobos still have this higher bone volume fraction amount of bone, despite being slightly smaller. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that that, that isn't the answer. And my feeling is that it is more um, something hormonal or genetic, which is leading to this difference bet between them. Okay, great, thanks. Are, are you planning on um, continuing your work mostly comparing chimps and, and humans or do you think that you'll be focusing um, on comparisons within the, the genus Pan, um, maybe yeah. between species and subspecies? So at the moment, actually, I'm mostly focusing on um, the trabecular structure of the foot across apes and also some fossil hominin species. Um, but what we are looking at, I didn't include it here, we've looked at ontogeny in the gorilla hands now, um, changes in the gorilla hand during, during development, which I think we'll, we will submit soon, and that we find a similar pattern to the chimpanzees in gorillas. So yeah, we, we continue to, to look for bonobos. To my knowledge, there is only one skeletal collection, at least in Europe, of bonobos, and we do now have hands and feet CT scan from that collection. So we can now look at across the hands and feet between bonobos and chimpanzees, but the, the sort of the data again is, is yeah, limited for that. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Um, I have one question, <laughs> one more question. <laughs> has, has anybody ever studied um, the effects of uh, shoes on uh, trabecular development. So do, pe do barefoot versus shod people develop trabecular bone differently? 
No, so that's something that we hope to do. Um, so there is a study on the external morphology of the talus, so the outside of the talus, that shows that different human groups that are wear sort of very stiff sole shoes, sort of less stiff sole shoes and barefoot shoes have a different external morphology of the talus. Um, so at least the outside, there are differences between groups. Um, so at the moment, um, last year I was supposed to CT scan some some feet of more active individuals, hunter gatherers, but of course it's been postponed. But so we're hoping to look at the differences um, between individuals based on, on whether they wore shoes. But again, this is from skeletal collections. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be great to get some data from living living individuals as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that, that that's that's cool. Sounds like a, a cool project. It, I, it just makes me think that like in the last uh, handful of years, we've actually learned quite a bit about sort of the difference in loading of feet in barefoot versus shod population. So I was thinking like there are good data out there to set up some predictions about what you would expect. Um, so, so yeah, right. that's cool. Um, all right. Any other questions? All right, well, in that case, um, I'll, I'll thank you once again, uh, Zudi, thank for you. the thank talk you. today. It was really wonderful. And um, you have the honor of being the, the final speaker in the, 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 the semester. So that's a, that's a, it's a good way to, to end uh, the colloquium series. So thanks everybody uh, uh, for, for coming. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you all uh, in, in the fall in the, the, the next uh, colloquium series.